So the, the, the subject matter I'm going to be preaching on tonight is on respect. And, you know, I, I think this first kind of popped into my head last week when I was preaching on the marriages and, and how one of the main uh, themes for, for having a successful marriage when it comes to a woman's ro the wife's role in, in regards to the husband is, is showing reverence under her husband or showing respect under her husband. And for, obviously for the husband, they need to love their wives. And those are kind of two main themes that we see coming up over and over again. Now, when I say that this is, that's what prompted this, this whole sermon isn't about wives respecting their husbands. That's not, that's not the point. Because what that conjured up in my own mind is just kind of thinking how we've turned into a society that just kind of lacks respect overall. Just in general, there's a lot of, of lack of respect towards many people. Uh, I, I was preaching this morning on, on Mother's and Mother's Day. You know, a lot of children these days seem to be lacking a lot of respect for their parents, for adults. Uh, young adults seem to lack a lot of respect for, for many people, you know, for people who are older, for elders. You know, the Bible teaches that we ought to respect our elders, and we're going to go into a lot of these different things tonight. But just the concept of, of respect and showing respect and being respectful is found all throughout Scripture. So we're going to look at some different things tonight. We're going to start off on giving respect who we should be giving respect to, how we should be giving respect, and then also getting respect, right? As much as men, men want to be respected, mostly, I mean, everybody, I think, wants to be respected. Nobody wants to just be blown off or treated like you're not very important or whatever. Not that you're trying to lift yourself up, but just, I mean, if you're, if you're talking to someone, you don't want to be dealt with just completely disrespectfully. That that's, uh, doesn't feel good for anybody. Everyone wants to be respected. So we're going to go through how the Bible teaches how we can be respected, respected in the eyes of man as well as respected in the eyes of God. And yes, God does show respect to people. Uh, it's, he's not a respecter of persons. And if we have time, I'll get into that because that's another topic that comes up. But um, that's kind of a, a, a little bit different from the, the, the scope of the sermon tonight. Now, when you're dealing with a subject like this, there's other words that come up besides respect in, in the Bible. Uh, reverence, regard, honor. These are all things that are very much related. But you just got to be careful in the context because they also have some slightly varying meanings that, that could be, uh, that's not quite associated with respect. So let's go ahead and dig into this. We're going to start off looking at how we ought to be um, how we ought to respect God, because that's primary, right? If, <laughs> when we're starting talking about respect, let's start off with respecting God, with respecting the Lord, and, and giving Him the respect that he, that he is due. Hebrews 12, verse number 7, the Bible reads, If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh, which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of things wrapped into this these few verses here, when it comes to the subject of respect. And what we're seeing here is uh, an aspect of being in submission, being in obedience to God. This, this has, uh, ties in perfectly with, with showing respect unto God. If someone's giving you, someone that's in authority is giving you rules or telling you what to do, giving you commandments, and you just don't care about it and you don't do it, obviously that's being very disrespectful to that person, whoever it is that's giving you commands. God has commandments for us, and we are expected to follow those. And if you are giving reverence or respect unto the Lord, then you're going to follow those things. And what the Bible's teaching here is that it's, it's how to deal with being chastened. Because just as with a family with little children, when a, when a child doesn't respect their parents, they ought to be chastened, they ought to be disciplined. 
And it's just assumed that that's going to happen, which is why the Bible is saying, hey, you know, when, when, when you are kids or when you have kids, you know, they get disciplined. They are chastised when they, uh, when they need to be corrected. And he says, well, we gave our parents reverence, right? We respected our parents after they disciplined us. How much more to God? And this is, this is explaining that, well, you know what? When you do wrong as a child of God, God is going to discipline you because you need it. He's going to correct you. And we ought to be showing reverence unto God and respect him the same way that you might respect your parent that gives you a physical beating. We need to be respecting the Lord as our father and, uh, and not be discouraged when he chastens us. Um, the Bible says in Psalm 119, you don't have to turn there, but the Bible says, Oh, that my ways were directed to keep thy statutes. Then shall I not be ashamed when I have respect unto all thy commandments. So one of the ways we respect God is by respecting his commandments, respecting what he tells us to do. And the Bible is telling us that if we can do that, if we have respect unto all God's commandments, then we won't be ashamed. You won't, you won't be ashamed of yourself, ashamed of your actions, ashamed of what you do when you can keep all of God's commandments and, and allow his ways to direct you, to keep his statutes. God demands our respect. God commands our respect. He, uh, you know, the Bible says even in the, in the Ten Commandments, you know, not to have any other gods before him and also not to take the name of the Lord, uh, take the name of the Lord your God in vain. When you're just throwing around God's name, this is a way that people very often commonly will disrespect God and not even realize it. There's a misconception on, on what it means to take the name of the Lord your God in vain. In vain just means like frivolous, frivolously or, or meaninglessly. People think that, that taking the name of the Lord in vain it has to do with like um, just saying a, a word like, it, like, which actually isn't even always incorrect. So like if God damns a place, right? If God damns something, that can be completely accurate and, and a good way of describing something. Now, when people just throw that term out there, I don't think that's good. I don't think people should be saying that. That's not necessarily using the name of the Lord in vain, though. I mean, if they're, if they're applying it, if they, if they really are mad about something, they want God to damn something, you know, it, it, that's, that's, not, that's not fitting for the definition of using the name in vain. Um, it could be, but Either way, I mean, that's obviously not, not something that people, I don't think, should be just going around and, and saying those things, especially just as a curse word or whatever on a regular basis. But using the Lord's name in vain, I think there's a lot more people guilty of this than they realize. For example, when people say, oh my God, as just an expression, you're surprised. Oh my God. Well, if you're not really talking to God, then why are you using his name? Why are you calling his name if you're not even thinking about like praying to God. Now we see, oh my God, often in scripture, especially in the book of Psalms, oh my God, you know, help me through this. Oh my God, deliver me. Oh my God, help me for my enemies. Because they're prayers, because somebody's actually speaking to God. That's not in vain. But when you're just doing your own thing and you just spout off the name of God, that is using the name of the Lord. Or how about Jesus? Or people say, Jesus Christ. That really, I mean, I don't know about you, that really bothers me when I hear people say that because they're just, basically, something happened that they want to curse about, they're angry about, they're upset about, and instead of even saying some curse, they're just saying the name of our Savior. They're just using that name as an expletive. That is, that is horrible. And that is definitely using the name of God in vain. People just throwing out that term. Now, I know a lot of people have this conditioned and they don't even think about it. That's why I'm bringing it up. Because if anyone's guilty of that, you need to think and stop and change what you're doing because that is breaking one of the Ten Commandments. And not only that, that specific commandment, using the name of the Lord in vain, shows how little you respect God and his name. The name of Jesus Christ is extremely important. The Bible says there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It's the name of Jesus Christ. His name is above every name. 
At the name of Jesus Christ, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, the glory of God the Father. That is an important name. We shouldn't just be uh, just throwing it around. We need to show respect. And when the name of God is used, it ought to be used in a very respectful manner. People who, who start using these terms for God, for the Creator, for the Divine, for, for, you know, the creator of heaven and earth, all powerful, almighty God, start calling God the man upstairs, the old man upstairs, right? Or instead of Jesus Christ, JC. And just, and just shortening things and, and making them, you know, just real, real familiar as opposed to showing respect. I mean, think about like, even just with kids, if, if my children start calling me by my first name, that's really disrespectful. They don't call me by my first name. The only time that ever happens is when they're real little and they're just repeating what they've heard my wife call me by my name. But that gets corrected right away. Why? It ought to be corrected because kids need to show respect unto their parents and we need to show respect unto our Heavenly Father and, and even more so because he's God. Amen. And be very careful with the language and the words that we use, whether we're talking to God or talking about God. We need to show respect. It's not something to be taken lightly. There's plenty of other areas in, in life that you can treat lightly, but God is not one of them. We need to show respect to God. We need to show respect to our parents. I already quoted this earlier uh, this morning uh, in the Ten Commandments. The Bible says, Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Honor. Show respect unto your parents. Honor them. Turn, if you would, to 1 Timothy chapter 5. So we ought to show respect. We ought to honor God. We, ought to need, we, we should be showing respect unto our parents, whether you're old or young. Kids, respect your parents. Listen to them. Obey their commandments. That's how you show respect unto them. <coughs> show respect unto your parents. Don't talk while they're talking to you. You need to listen. Think about even with how that could apply to God. You have all these problems in your life, right? And you want to talk to God and tell God, oh, instead of just listening, he's got the answer for you usually already right here. Or, I don't want to hear what you're trying to tell me about all these other things I'm doing wrong, God. I just want you to listen to me. Now, I'm not saying don't pray to God. God wants us to, to cast our cares upon him. But we really ought to consider ourselves and say, am I listening to God? Or am I just having a one-way conversation with God and, and using God like he's my genie in a lamp that's going to answer my wishes as opposed to my heavenly father who's going to provide me with instruction and tell me where I'm wrong in order to fix to help fix my problems. We don't pray to God looking just to, to magically fix everything. We're trying to get him to help us show us, illuminate us, give us wisdom so that we can do what's right and, and problems can be solved that way. Um, So we should be honoring and respecting God, obviously, honoring and respecting our parents. I have you turn to 1 Timothy chapter 5. We need to be, there's other people to show respect for as well. The Bible says in verse number 1, Rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father, and the younger men as brethren, the elder women as mothers, the younger as sisters with all purity. And again, this, this has to do with, I think, this basic respect for others and how we ought to be dealing with people and treating people. When it says to rebuke not an elder, I'm a very firm believer that this isn't primarily just talking about a pastor of a church. I think it could be applied that way. Don't get me wrong. I do believe. I don't think it's it that's misapplied. But primarily in the context, it's talking about an elder. It's talking about younger men. It's talking about elder women. It's talking about younger women. It's covering these different groups of older and younger people within church. I mean, that's the primary context of this passage. So you don't just go around rebuking an elder. Why? Because you respect your elders. You know, kids shouldn't be going around and just rebuking older people. 
rebuking adults. And younger men shouldn't go around rebuking older men. It's just not appropriate. You ought to show respect, and that's what the Bible's teaching here. But you entreat him as a father. It doesn't mean that older men are flawless and, and aren't in, even in need of being corrected. But the way that you do it as a younger person to a much older person, someone who's elder than you, you know, young guys coming in, man, they've been listening to preaching. They think they know everything and they're going to go and, and, and correct everybody. And they're going to correct the old guy that, yeah, maybe he's wrong about something. You don't just go up to his face and just, and just sharply rebuke him. That's not how you deal with, with someone who's your elder. You entreat them as a father. Why? Because you're showing them respect. Because someone, people who are older ought to receive that respect. That's what the Bible's teaching here. Respect them as you would respect a father and treat him as a father. And the younger men is brethren. Just because someone's younger doesn't mean that you talk down to them either. They're like your brother. Okay? Treat them as someone who is equal with you, not as someone who's lower than you. Right? The... The younger men, uh, it's not talking about children, it's talking about younger men, the elder women as mothers. So how would you talk to your mom? If someone needs, you know, again, maybe someone needs a rebuke. And maybe they don't, but how do you, how do you treat that person? Even if it's not about rebuking, how, are you going to entreat a, you know, an elder man as a father and, a, and an elder woman as a, as a mother? That's the way, that's the type of relationship that we ought to have, I mean, even within the church and even outside of the church, I believe. That's just a, just a basic level of respect that people need to have for one another. And it says, and the younger is sisters. So the younger men are brothers and sisters, older mothers and fathers. That's the type of relationship the Bible is saying is appropriate when you're dealing with other people. The Bible says in verse number three, honor widows that are widows indeed. And then later on, it's, it, it, it you know, gives us a little bit more information, but then it defines what a widow indeed is. So who it is that the church really is supposed to be caring for and taking care of. Now, that word honor here, just so you know, in this context, this is more than just being respected because this is talking about actually taking care of them. I, I brought this up in this morning's sermon, but when the word honor is used, it's just like honor your, your mother and your father. That's referring to the caring for, uh, especially whether it be financially or just, you know, their, their, their well-being. That's the, the usage here. And the Bible refers to a widow here that is to be honored, which is taken care of. Verse number 9 and 10 kind of gives these requirements for a widow to fit in order to fall in this category of, of being cared for by the church. Verse number 9 and 10 says, Let not a widow be taken into the number under three score years old. So 60 years old. She needs, she, she needs to be at least 60 years old in order for the church to be providing care for. This doesn't mean that if someone's under, a widow under 60 years old that you don't respect them. Right? That's why I want to make clear this is talking about caring for them. We already saw the level of respect. You treat, you treat a woman like this as your mother regardless. But this is someone who's going to receive the honor of being cared for. Uh, let not one be taken under three score years old, having been the wife of one man, well reported of for good works, if she have brought up children, if she have lodged strangers, if she have washed the saints' feet, if she have relieved the afflicted, if she have diligently followed every good work. So what we're going to notice here is that this widow being honored is also going to be reliant on, on her works, on her good deeds, how she lived. To receive that level of honor from the church, this isn't just automatically anyone, well, I'm 61 years old and I'm a widow, so the church needs to take care of me. That's, why would these, all these rules be here if that, if that were the case? And um, it is what it is. I think, I think that's a good, uh, <laughs> a good reason a good incentive to help people want to live more godly. How about care, thinking about yourself when you get older? If you become, you know, maybe you don't have any children or maybe, you know, who knows what's going to happen, right? And you want to be cared for, well, be well reported of for good works and, uh, and, and lodge strangers and, you know, and just basically be overall hospitable and, and, and giving and helping others. And, uh, and then you'll be cared for when you're older, jump down to verse number 17. The Bible says, Let the elders that rule well 
be counted worthy of double honor. So this is talking to about the elders that rule well in the church. This is now referring to that position of, of, a, of a bishop, the, the person who's elder spiritually, that rule well be counted worthy of double honor. And again, just to point out, that word honor doesn't, is not just talking about respect because if it was just respect, how do you have like double respect? It's just kind of a weird thing to have. You either have respect or you don't. It's one of those things you either have or you don't. Double honor is, is the caring of, right? The care that the church provides for the elder who's, who's devoting himself to completely serving and ministering to the church. That's the, the honor it's referring to. But again, tied to the works, it says, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. So not every elder is worthy of double honor. Just those that are worthy because they've labored in word and doctrine and they're doing all this hard work. Yeah, reward them for that. That's why the, the, the scripture follows up in verse 18. For the scripture saith, thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn and the laborer is worthy of his reward. So you got someone laboring, then honor them. Take care of them. Verse number 19, against an elder receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. Now let's um, flip over to Hebrews chapter 5. I just want you to see this. I want to point this out real, real quickly. Hebrews chapter 5. Since we read a little bit about, about elders, you know, receiving double honor, um, and we're talking about people who we should respect, obviously if you're caring for someone and giving someone double honor, even in a, in a financial sense, obviously those are people that you would respect. You have, you, you have respect for older people, you have respect for, for a, a leader of a church, and, um, but, there's one, uh, one type of preacher or leader of a church I don't have respect for, and that's for the self-ordained preachers. And again, I get, I get that from Scripture. Look at Hebrews chapter 5, verse number 1. Because this has to do with how a person should even get respect. And we're going to get more into that a little bit later. But Hebrews 5, verse number 1, the Bible reads, For every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way for that he himself also is compassed with infirmity and by reason hereof he ought as for the people so also for himself to offer for sin so this is talking about a high priest he's talking about the job that they did he's ordained for men and things pertaining to god meaning he's, he's doing the work of god you know in the an Old Testament high priest doing all this work, you know, uh, animal sacrifices, everything else. He's a sinner himself, so he needs to bring in these sacrifices for himself and for others. And then it says uh, in verse number four, and no man taketh this honor unto himself, but he that is called of God as was Aaron. So this is saying this position and, you know, being a high priest and being put in this position, it's an honorable position to be in, especially the high priest. The high priest is, is performing these sins, or excuse me, performing these sacrifices for sins, not, hopefully not performing these sins, performing these sacrifices for sins that is, is supposed to apply to, you know, the, all the children of Israel and they have these, these broad applications and doing a very important job. So it's a very honorable job. Be saying, you know what? No one just comes up and just takes that honor. So you know what? I'm going to be the high priest. I'm going to do this. And the people who did do that, who did take it upon themselves, were rebuked sharply for it. King Saul was one of them. Where he said, you know what, I can't, we can't wait around for Samuel to do this, even though it's his job, I'm going to do this right now. He wasn't appointed to do that. He took that honor upon himself and was rebuked for it, and rebuked sharply for it, and he paid for it. God didn't hold him guiltless for doing that. It's one of the reasons why he, uh, why he had his, his kingship taken away. Then verse number five says, So also Christ glorified not himself to be made an high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. The ultimate example saying not even Jesus Christ was taking that honor on himself of be, being the high priest. 
And that is something that was bestowed upon him. And we'll get into this a little bit more later, but ultimately the way that somebody gets honor and gets respect is by having that given to them. You cannot just take that and put it on yourself. So when someone decides to just take the honor of, of having a position of being an elder in a church, being a pastor of a church, and just saying, no, I'm just going to do this, and I'm going to start my own church, and I'm going to do this, I have no respect for that person because you're taking it on yourself. Not even Jesus did that. He waited for someone else to put that honor on him, to put that, you know, to, to give him that authority, to, to put him in that position. And every elder ought to be ordained by men, having men put their hands on them and, and ordaining them to become in that position, then being deemed worthy of having that honor. Because a church has already deemed them to be responsible and reliable to have that position. Turn over to... Um, Flip over to Leviticus chapter 19. We're talking about showing respect. We ought to show respect in our speech and in our actions. In our speech, you know, this is something that I'm actually really glad is still in existence, especially down in the South. You know, down here, this is something that I, I was not brought up with and didn't live around. And when we moved here, uh, it was a breath of fresh air. I was like, wow, this is great. And it's just the common courtesy of, of dealing with people and talking to people, yes, sir, and yes, ma'am. And, and that is something that hopefully we can't lose sight of and lose track of because it's really important. I didn't have that growing up in Chicago. Didn't exist. There was alre it's already been knocked down, that level of respect for people has already just just been brought low and and you know talking to people like doesn't matter even even as a younger child or whatever you're talking you know it, when you don't have those words associated sir and ma'am those help keep you in line and keep you in check with dealing with people respectfully even just losing those words can can start to, to lead to a less respectful conversation and caring of yourself. Um, and even in church, you know, pastor, you know, pastor Burzens. It's a level of, of respect that you give to somebody being in that position. Now, it doesn't bother me personally if you decide to say, hey, Dave, I'm not going to get worried or all up in a bunch about, about someone, say, you know, calling me by my name. I'm just saying, in, just in general, I mean, the same way I'm not going to get all offended if, if, if a younger person doesn't call me sir, but it's still appropriate, and I, th I still think it's the way that we ought to be just dealing with things in general, sir, ma'am, you know, pastor. But one thing, as I mentioned before, uh, uh, you know, I'll never give respect unto a self-ordained pastor. I also don't give, uh, I don't use words for pastors like reverend or father. Those are titles that should not be applied. Even though you want to show respect unto people, there's some things biblically that we shouldn't do. Psalm 111.9 says, He sent redemption unto his people. He hath commanded his covenant forever. Holy and reverend is his name. God's name is reverend. God's name is set apart and is something that, that gets the ultimate honor. And his name is reverend. That's why I don't think we should ever be referring to a religious leader as being reverend. Because God's name gets that title of being reverend. Mine doesn't. Sure, pastor or whatever, that's, that has a different um, meaning associated with it than reverend. Um, but also, like the, you know, the Catholic Church uses father. And Jesus Christ explicitly said in Matthew 23, he says, Be not ye called rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. That is the, the Jews. Right? The Jewish religious leaders are called rabbi. 
Jesus said, don't be called rabbi. It says, and call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. There are certain names or titles that are given that should only be reserved for God. And when you start applying those titles to man, that is disrespectful. Yeah. God commands respect and says, you know what? One is your master. One is your rabbi. One is your father. Amen. So use those terms just for him. I'm not going to go to man as a religious leader and say, oh, father. I'm going to talk to my father and say, oh, father. Right. I'm not going to bring his name and apply it to a to a person and it's the same thing with you know with rabbi it says neither be ye called masters for one is your master even Christ did I have you turn to Leviticus 19 perfect another way we could show respect show respect in speech so show respect by by using just proper terms when when you're when you're talking with people uh, terms that that will give respect uh, also something that is that is died within our culture but which is also biblical is that of rising when someone old, you know, an older person you know enters a room or is going to sit down it it's not just customary but there, i mean it is customary but it's customary for a reason it's customary because of what the bible teaches in leviticus 19 look at verse number 32 the bible says thou shalt rise up before the hoary Head. Hoary means like white, like a white-haired head. So someone who's older and they, and they have white hair. Thou shalt rise up before the hoary head and honor the face of the old man and fear thy God, I am the Lord. The Bible is teaching us, show that level of respect. When the old man walks in, you stand up. Why? Because standing up shows respect. Just the act of not being, you know, sitting down all relaxed, there's nothing wrong with sitting down and being relaxed. But when it's time to show respect unto somebody, you stand up. Right? I mean, in the military, what do you do when, when, when people are called to attention, right? You're standing up. If people are hanging out in the barracks or whatever, someone, you know, an officer walks in, what do they got to do? You got to stand up and show respect. They're not just going to be lounging around. And that's one area where, where respect is enforced. And, you know, I'm not saying that we all need to be exactly like the military, but, you know, we, we still ought to have a certain level of respect. And when the Bible's teaching that, you know, it, you have to fight against maybe how you were brought up and consciously think about these things. I know I do. I wasn't brought up being taught that I should be getting up when the hoary head walks in and showing that respect. That's something I'm still working on personally. Just, I mean, because I see that this is truth and this is what God is expecting of us. Well, then we ought to behave the same way. I mean, I was taught to open up doors for women. I was taught to do other things that, that show respect. But this one wasn't. And, and whatever it is in your life, when you recognize, you know what? I don't think I'm being respectful enough in, in these situations. Remember this. Think about it and change and show respect because it's important. And you may not even realize it now, but when you get older, you're going to want people to respect you. And if you want that to happen, then how about you start showing respect for other people now when they're in that position of respect? We ought to live respectably. Turn, if you would please, to 2 Timothy chapter 2. We need to be honorable, live respectably. The Bible says in Hebrews 13, 4, marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. So if we're going to live respectably, if you want to get respect, how about you live in a respectable manner? And what's respectable is if you're going to have a relationship with a person of the opposite sex, you're going to, have, you're going to get married to him. Marriage is honorable. There's honor in that. In making that vow and being with that person and being with that person alone. But that's why the Bible says, but whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. Whoremongers, that's people who aren't married and just going around and, and sleeping around. That is dishonorable. That is not a respectable way to live. And if you want to have people respect you, then don't go around fornicating and definitely don't go around committing adultery. 
because you're not going to get any respect that way. No one's going to respect. No one should respect you if you're doing these things. Marriage is what's honorable. Fornication, adultery, not worthy of honor at all. But in fact, God's going to judge you for that. 2 Timothy chapter 2, look at verse number 16. The Bible says, But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. And their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. Now what this is talking about here, it says in a great house, in God's house, a great house, there are many vessels. It's not, but not everybody that's saved not everybody that belongs, in God, that, that belongs to God's family because they're saved by grace is a vessel unto honor. There are some vessels that carry, you know, our bodies are our vessels, right? That, that are going to be vessels of gold and of silver and they're doing good things and they're following God's commandments and they're doing what's right and they're doing what's honorable. And they're not, they're, they're, they're being, uh, uh, living a way that's, that's very respectful, especially in the eyes of God and in the eyes of man. But there's others that are dishonorable. There's people who are out there walking in their flesh. And yeah, they're saved, but they're vessels unto dishonor. And the Bible says, if a man purge himself from these, well, what's the these? That's why we read this whole thing in context. When you go back, these is like verse 19 says at the end, departing from iniquity and all the way back up to 16, shunning profane and vain babblings. Uh, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. It brings up this example of Hymenaeus and Philetus. And these guys were just preaching these, they had these vain babblings, just preaching profane doctrines. And what the Bible is saying is, shun that stuff. Don't, don't uh, engage in that. Don't, don't allow that in. He says, why? For it will, they will increase unto more ungodliness. The more you're going to listen to these guys, when you start hearing profane and vain babblings, just say, I'm done with you. I'm shunning it. I don't want to hear it anymore. Because if, when you allow them to just continue and you're just going to keep receiving that stuff, it's going to lead you into more ungodliness because their doctrines, are just, that's not going to be the only thing that's screwed up. They're going to keep on um, just messing with you. So that's how we're going to, you know, we're depart from that iniquity. We're going to shun the profane and vain babblings. And uh, when you purge yourself from all these, from from these vain babblings and profane teachers, then you could be a vessel unto honor, set apart. That's what sanctified means because you're, getting the, you're purging the sin out of your life. You're departing from iniquity and then you'll be ready for God to use you and prepare it unto every good work. That is how we can live respectfully. Now, let's look at getting respect. We're going to start from gaining God's respect. Flip over to... Um, Genesis chapter 4. Being respected by man and being respected by God, obviously I think everyone would much rather just, if anything, be respected by God. Because that's what we care about the most. We ought to please God rather than men. But I think it's important, you, you can get both. At least to a certain degree. Because if you, if you gain God's respect, you are going to gain some men's respect. Genesis chapter 4, we're going to see some people who gained God's respect. And actually, it's, it's very simple. And you probably already know the answer on how we're going to get God's respect. But let's look at some of the verses that deal with this. Genesis chapter 4, verse number 3, the Bible says, And in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. So it wasn't just on his offering. He said he had respect unto Abel 
as well as his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering, he had no respect. And Cain was very wroth and his countenance fell. And this is key. So basically, Cain brings the work of his hands. He brings his work, what he did in the field. He did all this work and he brings that before God as an offering. And God doesn't respect it. He doesn't respect him or what he did because it was just his work. Versus Abel's gift, of course, he brings a sacrifice, a blood sacrifice, which obviously is picturing atonement. I'm not going to get into all the, the ways that this foreshadows Jesus Christ and everything else, work salvation versus salvation by grace through faith. But um, Abel's sacrifice is respected. But when, when Cain gets angry because God doesn't respect him, he's not accepting what he, what he did and his works, God answers him, and he says in verse 7, If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted. He's saying, I would have respect unto you and your offering if you just did what was right, if you did what you're supposed to do. Abel did that we were supposed to do, which was just offering that sacrifice, that blood sacrifice, that blood atonement. Cain was doing it his own way and bringing his own works and offering up what he had to offer instead of relying on the, the atonement of, of a sacrifice being made for us. And again, obviously there's a lot more symbolism there, but ultimately that response by God is just saying, hey, if you do well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. He's saying that, you know, all you got to do is do right. Leviticus 26, turn if you would to um, 1 Samuel chapter 2. I'm going to try to get through this real quick. I'm getting a little bit short on time. Leviticus 26, 3 says, If ye walk in my statutes and keep my commandments and do them. And then he goes on and on in Leviticus 26. You could read that in context later. But he starts off saying, if you do this, he says, then I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. You're going to be blessed in this way. You know, and then in verse nine, it goes on to read, for I will have respect unto you and make you fruitful and multiply you and establish my covenant with you. So the way for God to have respect unto you, if you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments, if you do, that's right. If you listen to what I say, if you're doing what I'm commanding you to do, then I'll give you respect. You show me respect, right, being God. You show God respect by listening and obeying him. In turn, he'll give you respect. He'll have respect unto you and say, okay, good. Yeah, you've listened. You're doing well. I respect that. My children, if they're disobeying me and not doing what I'm telling them to do, I'm not going to have any respect unto them. No, you do what's right first. If you want to get my respect, do what's right. And that's what God's saying. Listen to me and obey me and respect me, then I'll give you respect. It's a two-way street. Anyone that wants to get respect, you need to learn to give respect first. And it's going to work the same way with God as it does with, with people. You can never demand respect. You can't, you can't go to God and say, I demand your respect and just have things your way. That's Cain's way. Hey, I did all this, God. Respect me for it. No. Obedience. Listen to God. Do what God says. Then you can get that respect. The Bible says in one thir uh, Psalm 138, 6, here in 1 Samuel chapter 2, Though the Lord be high, yet hath he respect unto the lowly, but the proud he knoweth afar off. So the other, the other aspect, and this goes hand in hand with following all of God's commandments, is being humble. Because you've got to be humble to be able to, to honor God's commands and, and do them. And, and realize you're not the boss, he's the boss. And submit yourself unto God's authority. You have to be humble in order to do those things. Amen. I don't see how a proud person can actively just keep God's commandments. It's, just, it's, it's not going to, you need to have... You need to be humble in order to keep God's commandments. So God has respect unto the lowly. 1 Samuel chapter 29, or chapter 2, verse 29 says, Wherefore kick ye at my sacrifice and at mine offering, 
which I have commanded in my habitation and honorest thy sons above me. This is God rebuking Eli uh, for, for honoring his sons above me. It says, to make yourselves fat with the chiefest of all the offerings of Israel, my people. Eli's sons were wicked people. They were actually children of Belial. They weren't saved at all. And they were, you know, um, causing people to hate bringing their sacrifices before the Lord because they were just stealing of them and taking the fat and taking what they wanted and just making a miserable experience. They were fornicators, you know, but instead of doing something about it, he just looked the other way. He never corrected them. He never got them out of the position. He just let it continue to happen. And God's saying, well, well, that shows me who you honor and respect more. You honor and respect your own children more than you honor and respect me because God's rules and God's command was say, get those wicked people out of there and deal with them and deal with your children and discipline them and chasten them and, and don't allow them to do what they're doing because when you just allow that to happen, you're saying, I care more about them than I care about the Lord because Eli was obviously in disobedience to God by allowing those things to continue. And he says, uh, he says, you honor thy sons above me to make yourselves fat in the chiefest with the chiefest of all offerings of Israel, my people. Verse 30 says, wherefore the Lord God of Israel saith, I said indeed that thy house and the house of thy father should walk before me forever. But now the Lord saith, be it far from me for them that honor me, I will honor. And they that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. You want to be honored by God? You want to be respected by God? Honor him, respect him. That's how it works. You have to, you have to go there first. We already mentioned, you know, humility is involved. The Bible says in Proverbs 18, 12, before destruction, the heart of man is haughty and before honor is humility. So you want to you want to be respected. You want to be honored. You want to be lifted up and have people look up to you or respect you. You need to learn to be humble. Another thing that will help you to gain God's respect. Uh, you can turn if you want. I'm going to just read from Proverbs 4 real, real quickly here. Another help in gaining God's respect is by getting wisdom. And again, getting wisdom is going to be involved with being humble, being lowly, because recognizing that you don't know everything and looking to learn something and have learning imparted to you, you have to be humble to receive, to be taught and not think you know everything already. Humble heart, humble attitude, receive of God's word, receive that wisdom and God will show respect unto that. Verse number seven in Proverbs four, the Bible reads, wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. And with all that getting, get understanding. Exalt her, talking about wisdom, and she shall promote thee. She shall bring thee to honor when thou dost embrace her. So when you get wisdom, you're studying God's word. You're, you're asking God to, to give you more wisdom, give you understanding, get that knowledge receiving of God because you're humble, because you're open, because you're willing to, to, to get that word, then you'll be promoted. Then you'll be lifted up. Why? Well, through God's word, through this wisdom, you're going to be getting the commandments, right? And if you're, if you're getting the wisdom, you're going to be applying what you've learned. It's not just knowledge. You're gaining wisdom. The wisdom is there to, to show to, because you're keeping the commandments. It's, it's getting that greater wisdom more than just knowledge. And, uh, and that's going to help you to gain respect also in the eyes of God. Now, uh, gaining man's respect is very similar. Now, you're not, you know, God is an authority, so we're going to submit to God 100% no matter what. Not every other person, though, is an authority, so you don't, you know, gain their respect exactly the same way. But I'll tell you what, being humble is a good way to get people's respect. Not everybody's. Some people have no, some people look at humility as a sign of weakness. But that's all right. I don't care about their respect. If people are only going to respect, you know, someone who's, who's going to be in a position of power, that's, that's not a person's respect I care to have. It doesn't, that doesn't matter to me. But just in general, if you want to gain respect of decent people, 
One, don't be a hypocrite. Be a man of your word. What you say is, it should be what you do. I have a lot of respect for people that if something comes out of their mouth, I can hold them to it. And I know I can. And I know they're going to follow through. Because they're, they've already been tried and true and they're going to do it. They're not going to fail me. They're not going to, you know, say one, oh yeah, this person's always saying about everything they're going to do and then never follows through. It's not as much respect there. Yeah, their heart may be willing, but if you never do anything, there's only so much respect that you can get for that. Because re the respect comes from your actions more than your intentions. Just like with God. You may intend to keep his commandments, but you actually got to keep them to get, to get God's respect. If you're just always breaking his commandments, yeah, but I really want to, to obey. Okay, that's good. You should want to obey, but do it. <laughs> There's a difference between wanting and actually doing. You got to do it. You got to be faithful. You got to work hard. And then you got to, gaining uh, men's respect, you got to lead by example. You know, some people get put into positions of authority, whether it may be on a job or even at home. You put in a position of authority. If you want people to respect you, you need to be able to lead humbly, but lead by example, lead by doing. A lot of respect comes when you can see people doing the work. When, when you're doing, just because you're a boss doesn't put you above doing common work or doing, doing work with people. And when people see you are working real hard, there's a lot more respect Say, say a boss finds an employee not really working, right? And they need to reprimand them or discipline them in some way. If that employee saw his boss not really working, they're going to be like, well, who are you to tell me, you know, to get to work? I'm just following your example, right? And there's not going to be much respect for that boss when he says something. They may or may not listen to him. But when they've got a boss doing a lot of work and they can see it's obvious to everyone, they're the first one there in the morning, the last one to leave, you know, they're working hard. They say, hey, how can we not, you know, what are you doing? Why are you slacking off? They're at least going to have a lot more respect. Oh, hey, I mean, this guy's showing the way it's done. And that's, that's another way that you're going to gain respect, um, just humanly speaking. Now, with all this respect going around, let's just deal with respect of persons. I'll just do this real quickly. Turn to Leviticus chapter 19, and that, that's the last place I'll have you turn. You maybe, you get, we're going to go to James 2 also. But one thing I don't respect is I don't respect all religions. And... I don't, think, I don't think God wants us to. We're not supposed to show respect unto the dumb idols and to the stock and to the stone and to, to these devils that people are worshiping that are leading people away from the Lord. Yeah, I don't think we have to respect that. I don't think we have to respect lies and error and evil and wickedness. We're supposed to be respecting goodness and truth and God and how can you show respect unto some false God if you're going to show respect unto the Lord when God said, thou shalt have no other gods before me and basically, you know, learn not the way of the heathen and just so, you know, command after command after command. And we, are, just recently we went through, um, I think it's in Deuteronomy where he's, you know, when, when someone's trying, it was on uh, Wednesday night, Judges 19, talking about the children of Belial. When someone goes and tries to, to lead you away, right, and follow some other God that your fathers didn't know and, and lead people away from serving the Lord, they're supposed to be put to death and you're supposed to burn their city with fire when you got people like that. That's God's commandments. And you think he wants you respecting another religion? No. No, because there's only one true God. You don't show respect under the fantasy. Because that's what it is. It falls... Islam is, is, is a made-up, imaginary God. It's not real. Why would I respect make-believe? Right. 
Now you can show respect to people who are deceived. But I'm not going to respect every religion. And I'm not going to respect that people believe a fairy tale either. When I deal with a person, I will try my best to show respect unto that person and help show them the truth. And I think that's appropriate. But um, let's just deal real quick because as we're dealing with this concept of respect, the Bible talks about having respect of persons. This isn't the same as the way that you would deal with someone and just showing them common respect. This has to do mostly with how you judge and determining what's right and wrong. When you have respect of persons, that has more to do with you giving favor to one person over another, uh, whether it be arbitrarily or for some reason it has nothing to do with the actual judgment, right? So if you've got someone who's real rich and you benefit from financially and someone who's poor that doesn't do anything for you, if they have a matter between themselves, you can't be a respecter of persons who go, oh, well, I like this person and they really helped me out, so I'm going to rule in their favor. That's wickedness because now you're not judging the facts. You're not judging righteous judgment, which is just who's right and who's wrong. You're, at, you're just being persuaded by a person because of your own personal gain or interest or, or how much you like that person. That's what the Bible is referring to. Leviticus 19.15, though, explains this. It says, You shall do no unrighteousness in judgment. Thou shalt not respect the person of the poor, nor honor the person of the mighty, but in righteousness shalt thou judge thy neighbor. So whether whoever you're inclined to, I mean, maybe you're poor, just because the other person's poor doesn't mean you should you know, give them more weight or more validity than something, you know, hey, just, just deal with every situation for what it is. Judge righteous judgment. Um, you could turn to James 2. I'll just read from Deuteronomy 1.17. The Bible says, You shall not respect persons in judgment, but you shall hear the small as well as the great. You shall not be afraid of the face of man, for the judgment is God's, and the cause that is too hard for you, bring it unto me, and I will hear it. Being a respecter of persons, I think, is, is actually a really good concept for this uh, judge not mentality from other Christians. Well, who are you to judge? You know, well, Deuteronomy 117, where it says right there, it says, you know, don't be afraid of the face of man, for the judgment is God's. In the context of you judging. So God's saying, you judge righteously. It doesn't matter if someone's been going to church their whole life or not. Just make a righteous judgment and don't worry about other people because it's God's judgment. So when you tell someone, hey, your religion is going to send you to hell. Oh, well, who do you think you are to judge? Well, look, the judgment's God. And I'm not going to be a respecter of persons because you say you're a Christian because you've been going to church since you were five years old. That's not going to give me more respect to be a respecter of persons to all of a sudden say, oh, well, yeah, I guess you could believe in baptismal regeneration and salvation through works. Okay. No, I'm still going to give the same judgment and say, well, that belief is going to damn you. Right. And the judgment's God's, not mine. I'm not sending anybody to hell. Right. And yes, I am judging when I do say, hey, if you believe this, you're going to go to hell. I'm judging. But it's not my judgment. It's, it's God's judgment. It's what, it's, I'm just repeating what the Bible says. I'm just repeating God's judgment that he's already pronounced. That if your faith is not in the Son of God, if it's not in Jesus Christ, if you don't believe, that is belief. If you don't believe it's by faith, then you're not saved. That plain and simple. If you believe not the record that God has given of his son, that God hath given to us eternal life, eternal life, and that this life is in his son, you've made God a liar. So if you don't believe it's eternal, you're making God a liar. Look, that's not my judgment. That's what 1 John chapter 5 says. That's God's judgment. James chapter 2, verse 8, we're going to close on this. The Bible says, If you fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, you do well. But if you have respect to persons, you commit sin. So being a respecter of persons, this isn't showing respect to people. That's why I make clear, because you're going to see respect of persons a lot when you read the Bible. 
We ought to be respecting people. We ought to be respectful. We ought to live respectably. We ought to try to gain respect of God by obeying his commandments. But we shouldn't be respecters of persons. If you, if you have respect to persons, you commit sin. You're convinced of the law as transgressors. To have respect of persons is not good. Why is it not good? For, for a piece of bread, that man will transgress. What that's referring to, again, is being persuaded by what someone's going to give to you and perverting your judgment, receiving gifts in judgment. That's a bribe, right? Judges that judge today that receive bribes, they're being respecters of persons. When someone buys off a judge, they are respecting persons. They're committing sin. That's wicked. And the Bible says that's, that's sin. And we ought not to be the same way. And maybe you're not a judge in the sense, you know, for the state or something, but we all judge matters. So there's always going to be some elements of your life where you have to judge what's right and what's wrong. And, uh, and you have to judge righteously. So I just, I hope and pray that, that we can turn, at least within the church, our culture around and try to live respectably. You know, Talk to people respectfully, rise up for the hoary head, you know, just just start instituting these things, teaching our children. You know, when you speak to uh, to adults, be respectful, call them Mr., Mrs., Sir, Ma'am, you know, use terms of respect. And uh, and, you know, that's going to show that these little things, while they may be little individually, will all add up and have a powerful impact on other people as well as on our own children when they learn how to live and show respect on others and live a respectable life. And I think we need a little bit more of that as, as Christians today. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much um, for all of the instruction that you give us. Lord, help us to, to recognize when we are not being respectful when we should be, God, I pray that you please help us to uh, apply these, these truths and these teachings to our life. God, help us to, to live better and more righteously. God, we, we want to be respected by you. We want to be able to live in a way that's pleasing to you. Open up our understanding. Help us to learn, to grow, to get wisdom, to stay humble, and uh, to be obedient under your commandments because we know that all of these things will lead us to, uh, to gain your respect, Lord. You have ours. We love you, and we thank you so much for all that you have done and continue to do, Lord, for the, for the amazing gift of eternal life that none of us deserve, but that you still have decided to bestow upon us. And, um, and God, we, we thank you so much for that. We are truly humbled by your grace. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.